and another one that's up above, all the allies are going to uh, show up here. So that's a, another way to, to kind of prove the, the power there. If I have any classes, uh, in fact, let me see. Let me go sneak over here and see. We have a, uh, any good classes in my example here. Uh, or I could even use maybe a type. Down here, or spans. Again, if I have all these uh, various spans, but then I turn around and say, no, I don't want to select them all. Just give me the first one that's found on the page. What I'm going to find out is that that uh, you know immediately is over here to this uh, do audio check. It's really, by the way, I added these uh, check items on this page. If I were to run this right now. Uh, you'll 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 appreciate the fact that I, I was concerned. Uh, I'll take that uh, break tag off. Uh, you know, make sure and do audio check, video check, and buy the text a drink. I think that was also a, a, a check item for for I think uh, that, the other things tomorrow. Do you have any way of making that high priority item? It, yes, I, I I should make that a high priority by by adding a class or doing something that would really make it stand out. And in fact, that's really a nice segue to what we really should be talking about next, and that is uh, the manipulation of the DOM. It's one thing to go find all those items. You know, we can go query them and query them, but now what are you gonna do with it, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's kind of why I was in the debugger, because I was thinking, well, yeah, it's fun to go find it, but to really showcase what you're gonna do, you have to do something with it, you yeah. know, once you have it. Now, Michael, do you mind if I show something real quick? I want you to. All right, now, if you're using Code Show, You'll recognize that there is a um, option used whenever you're, whenever I in the code am querying the, the object that you'll just see. It's a function called Q, and I want to show you how that works. I, I got a little bit annoyed with the fact that there's a query selector and query selector all, and sometimes I want one and sometimes I want the other. Granted, they're very different functionality, and I'm thrilled that they both exist. But um, I wanted to encapsulate those with one call whether it was going to return one object or an array of objects. And I also um, found it a little bit inconvenient that it was a node list, even though it's an advantage because it's a, a dynamic object, a live object. Um, I wanted an array because I, if, if I have an array, I can use all of my array functions. And so I encapsulated that. You'll find that in the ocho.js, which in the Code Show project is under the JS folder. And it's called ocho.js, and that's just a library of a lot of functions that support this project. At some point, it might come out on its own, but for now, it's just a part of Code Show. And there's a function in there called query. So you'll notice that uh, there's the WinJS namespace. It's just the utilities namespace. There's a function called query. And you're free to just jump into ocho.js and grab that and, and pull it out if you want. But, but then if that's called query, how am I using Q everywhere? And the way I'm doing that is under the JS, the default JS is the main JavaScript file for the app, for the Code Show app. And if you scroll to the very bottom, you'll notice that there are a few things that I'm doing in the global namespace. Now, I know that uh, I think it's either that a kitten dies or something like that every time you use the global namespace as a place to store your functions and properties. But what do you mean by global namespace? What, what would define that that was in the global namespace? Well, these immediate functions that you showed us before, the purpose of those was to encapsulate everything on the page. And so usually everything on the page should be bef in between the opening and closing of that function. Let me just collapse that. And you can see that there's the immediate function, and then there's a bunch of stuff that's oh, happening outside okay. of it. Now, I personally don't feel like it's terrible to use the global namespace. You just have to be aware that you're using the global namespace, and whatever you define in here is going to be available everywhere. And I decided that I want to use the Q function everywhere, so I capture that query function, call it Q, and now it's available everywhere inside the app. Nice. So everywhere that you see query selector, query selector all, get element by ID, all of that can be replaced with simply Q but you could still use the originals. So I just wanted to let everybody know that since you're going to be using the code you know, in Code Show, you want to know how that Q function works. That's helpful. And, and for those of you that really want to know how it behaves, and if you really have you've been using jQuery, almost imagine Q was like a dollar sign to some extent, because that's really what it does is it says, whether it's a single or a many, I'm going to go, you know, I can handle that for you. So when you see that used everywhere in the project, that's it's it's eliminating all the typing of all the documents, query, you know, query selectors and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, in fact, if we switch back to my screen for just a second, uh, the Q method actually does take a context and some options. So you can do your, if I can type, you can do your uh, searching for element by ID div one, and then you can say in the context of, and this might be 
some other DOM element. And now it will limit the results of this to only search that yeah. DOM element. So That's things like that, yeah. Very cool. So uh, I think the main takeaway leading up to this point is a lot of different ways that we can go grab what we want out of the uh, DOM, the document object model. And of course, the main reason why you want to do that is you typically want to do something with it. Hey, welcome back. Hey. We're here on, what module are we on? Six? Six of six? Last one of the day. That should wrap it up. All right. This, this topic is advanced topics. <laughs> so obviously, it's kind of a catch-all. Uh, there are a number of things that we wanted to talk about, and um, they're kind of all encapsulated in, in advanced topics. So we're going to throw a few things in here. And actually, Michael's going to start us off with exception handling, extremely important topic yeah. in writing any app. Did you notice how he said we're going to throw a few things in there? Yeah, I caught that pun. So, yeah, it was uh, suddenly decided that I was the most qualified person to talk about all the errors that happened because apparently they happened to me the most. So that's fine. I'll, I'll go ahead and go with that. Uh, let's let's uh, dive into what we're going to be doing with uh, our module. Uh, it, it's going to start off, of course, with uh, handling exceptions. And then uh, we're going to get into a whole bunch of other cool things that Jeremy's going to uh, get into greater detail. But with regard to all this error handling stuff, I would like to look at it this way. When we're talking about handling exceptions, we're talking about managing failures in code. And we're also talking about minimizing those failures in code. So managing them is different than minimizing them. I'd like to do both. I'd like to talk about both. So. Uh, the first one would be how you could manage them, because this is not really minimizing them, it's just managing them. Uh, and you, you may be familiar with this uh, type of syntax, uh, but here's, here it is. It's a try, catch, finally block, of which the uh, uh, finally, of course, is uh, optional. And in fact, on, based on how you're using it, uh, some of these things are out. Even the catch could be optional uh, with just a finally block. But the typical uh, use would be at least a try and a catch and possibly a finally block. Uh, the main ingredient here is that when you are looking at your uh, try, the first thing you want to do is you're saying, okay, well, what are the suspicious lines of code? And, and when we say suspicious lines of code, what we mean is something that could potentially cause a problem. Uh, this could be a custom error that's thrown from a, an API. It could be maybe you're trying to go across the uh, network or something and grab something through a call. You don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. Uh, so th there's a number of reasons why something could be suspicious about, I don't trust that this is going to work. Uh, which is different than a syntax error. Uh, so, for example, if I had a syntax error in that try, like var, V-A-R-R, -R, uh, in there, and, and I misspelled it, well, we're going to more than likely, you're going to get that one caught immediately uh, in the parsing engine itself. So the try is going to actually catch things that would be thrown as a runtime as opposed to like a syntax uh, error. And so j just keep uh, those two in mind. Syntax, you're going to have it caught right away. Usually, in, like for example, in Visual Studio, it's going to report it immediately the, the moment you try to run it. If it's a syntax error, like V-A-R-R, -R, which is not a keyword. Uh, but it's not going to know at design time or when you're attempting to run it if the line of code will succeed in going and grabbing that data or whatever the case is, or if you're going to misuse the data in some way. So uh, going back to the try catch finally, that's what we mean by line or lines of suspicious code. When we catch, the ERR I have in this example is just the name I provided. You can call it whatever you want. A lot of times I see E there. Sometimes I see EX. I don't know. What do you see there? Uh, I see E a lot. I like to use E because it means either error or exception. Sure. That, that's good. And, and then the classic uh, properties, I just put them in comments right there, you know, from description, message, name, number, and stack. Uh, you could access any one of those to get some further information on it. Uh, message is uh, probably the most popular one because it kind of gives that robust, here's what happened. Uh, but then there's a, a, a couple other ones there that can give you some more detailed information, especially about how or where it was thrown. Uh, 
The finally means whether we succeed or fail. So whether we ended up in the catch or completed the try successfully, we're going to call the finally block no matter what. So that, that's a nice little uh, safety net there uh, to do some last minute, whatever you need to do in the finally. Now, the other thing you can do is throw an error. And there's, a, there's a multiple ways to do this. In fact, you're going to see another way in a demo in just a moment. But in this example called throw helper, uh, it's a horrible helper, by the way, because the only thing it does is it throws an error. So it's a lousy helper. But it is helping me to, with no uh, pun intended on the word helping, to showcase that one of the reasons why you would throw an error is because you are creating an API, even if you're the consumer of that API. So a helper function nested somewhere, how is it going to report if you misused it? Well, one way is by throwing an error. You could throw an error uh, the classic JavaScript way by providing an error number and the description. And you'll see another way to do it within the uh, Windows 8 world in just a moment. So elsewhere in the code, if I try to use this throw helper and I put it in a try catch block as I'm doing down below, then what that means is I will have the ability to catch it. So this is what it's going to do. It's going to say, all right, let's go ahead and grab a consolidated message by concatenating whatever the number was, as well as the message, and then you know we'll lock it somewhere. So that's a, a classic use of what you might do inside of a catch block is notify or log somewhere what happened. So I would like to now demonstrate uh, this. And I'm going to go into Visual Studio. And the first thing that I would like to highlight is the other way that you could throw uh, an error. Uh, the WinJS, uh, which is a, an API that's available for us as developers in JavaScript, gives us uh, this error from name which means instead of us thinking in terms of error numbers, why not just give uh, a, a categorical type of a, a name to it, and then you can also pass in uh, whatever your message is. So error from name is a nice way uh, to do this. And, and basically, underneath the hood, it is a JavaScript error. It just a, it's a nice little API to, to make that easy. And of course, it returns an error object uh, that can be queried for all the things we've already talked about so far. But I think the other benefit of talking about this function, uh, which is called is type of, and this is again in code show, it allows us to say, we want to know if the first object that's being passed in is of a certain type. And the type is going to be uh, passed in as a string. Now, one of the things that we need to do anytime we're in JavaScript, and, and Jeremy, you mentioned this earlier in the day. You're like, one of the advantages we have when we're in a, uh, in a strongly typed language is that there's some worries that we don't worry about. You know, If we say, hey, this was assigned as a string, we know it's going to be a string. Strongly typed. Weakly typed, not the case. Right. So sometimes in our code, what we want to do is we want to say, well, what are you? <laughs> I want to know what you really are. And there's a few ways that you can, and you can query that. I created this helper function that was called this type of because I wanted to say, I want to have an exact way to know exactly what this is for sure. But I wanted to be careful not to inadvertently cause errors <laughs> in this type of function. So if we look at the code, I think this is really uh, important to, to see, especially if you're relatively new to JavaScript, this line can look a little confusing. We're saying if t, now remember, that's an argument that's being passed in here. If t, <laughs> we're not saying it equals anything. We're just saying if t, and then we're using this uh, double ampersand operator, which is really, uh, it's very cool. Because what this is saying is we're going to start here and evaluate that t to be true or not true. And it would be false if, for one, we didn't pass it in as an argument. So what if I just said is type of, I passed in the o or, or nothing at all. That would mean t is undefined. The default behavior here from a Boolean perspective is that means that this t, if we didn't pass it in, would be undefined, and therefore it would evaluate to a false. If you're using double ampersand operator like this, if this side of the equation is ever false, it just stops. It does nothing else. That's an advantage for us, because now we can go to, if it's true, yeah, I got a t, I got a t. 
Great. Well, now what? Well, does T have a char 